This is Tyrannus Acre Forward, the ag industry's most thought-provoking podcast. Listen to interesting people as we go in-depth into the issues affecting crop advisors, growers, and farm communities. Uncovering the truth about the ag business and using technology to prepare for the unforeseeable. Ready to explore the future? Let's dig in. It's Mike, and in this episode here at the Acre Forward Podcast, really, really excited to have the only other podcast and the first one to come up when you search for the word Acre Forward uh, to use the phrase Acre Forward since we started. So I'm joined here, and you're going to know him. He has a great podcast. He's very prolific and well-known in the industry. Mr. Chip Flory. Mr. Chip Flory, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here today on the Acre Forward Podcast. Absolutely, Mike. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, I think we've got a lot to, uh, to talk about. And, and obviously, between the two of us, we're probably going to more than fill the hour. Uh, but let's get to a few points. I want to learn a little bit more about who you are. For those that are tuning in, I'm sure many know. But before we do this, I want to tease the episode. We're going to talk about a magic or a golden or a core number when it comes to crop door. Is that right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like we'll, we'll, uh, when when we wrap up the conversation about uh, the crop tour and the pro farmer crop estimate, uh, I'll let you know what I think is the most important number. One number. One, one number. The, yep. The most important number that we'll get from crop tour this year. So two hosts on this podcast is going to get you to one number that you need to know if you're subscribed and listening to Acre Ford. No, that's really, really great. So uh, you joined pro farmer as a floor reporter for future world's news in yep. nine eight right so iowa state all this so first of all what is pro farmer yep. what are futures floor trading yeah help help us understand kind of how did shift floor get started on the road to this magic number around crop tour and pro farmer <laughs> okay uh finished up what i you know what i have to go all the way back to 1981 where this thing started because uh I was a sophomore in high school. I was driving down the road with my dad and pro farmer at the time had something that was called the pro farmer minute. And it was on radio. Uh, and actually the, the editor at pro farmer that, that put it together is Ron Michelson, who just happens to be Davis Michelson's, uh, dad. And Davis is my news anchor on, on Agritalk now. Uh, but we're driving down the road. The pro farmer minute comes on yep. and it was a tough time for the Flory farm in, in 1980 and 1981. It really was. And dad was doing everything that he could to manage the risk that was associated on the farm. And he heard something in that pro farmer minute that made him stop, turn the truck around, go back to the house, make some phone calls. And when he came back out and it was time to go back in on that parts run, he felt he sounded more confident to me. He acted more confident. And basically what he had done at that time was he had set the price on corn and soybeans because this was something that, uh, you know, he'd been waiting for the for the right message to get that done. And he got that message from the Pro Farmer Minute on, on radio. Uh, that left an impression on me, Mike, that really did. And from from that point forward, Pro Farmer was something that I was thinking about and, and wanted to be a part of somehow, some way, someday. And I mean, I even went to college, uh, Iowa State University, with the idea that that uh, when I'm done with this thing, someday I'm going to be the editor at Pro Farmer. So I want, I'm, I'm going to, you know, kind of uh, create a curriculum for me that is going to work best for me at Iowa State and put me in the best position for that. So I talked to one of the editors up there at Pro Farmer, Bob Kaufman, uh, before I left for school. And I said, if I want your job someday, what what should I be doing? And we talked through it. And believe it or not, finals week of my senior year, my last semester, Bob Kaufman called me just to check up and see how things are going. Uh, they he, he claimed that, uh, the, that they didn't have a space for me at, at Pro Farmer at that time but that we needed to stay in touch. 
the next day I get a, get a call from these guys at Futures World News, and they needed a floor reporter covering the commodity markets at the Chicago Board of Trade and the grain markets in particular. Um, I, I had a job kind of lined up and ready to go uh, in broadcasting. Yeah, but uh, but boy, I tell you what, I jumped to that opportunity. Spent three and a half years in Chicago at the floor of the Board of Trade, and that's where risk management, the commodity markets, uh, trading, really got its way into my DNA. Now, uh, it's uh, it, it it was an exciting period because I could I, I came out of 4-H. I was big in 4-H. I was all about setting goals and putting down markers and, you know, doing all of that stuff to, so that I could check my progress. And it felt like, Hey, things are working. I feel like at some point, someday I am going to be the editor at pro farmer. Well, uh, turned out that I was then for 17 years, uh, 17 years, 17 years. I was the editor of pro farmer from 1997 until 2014. Wow, that's amazing to know what you want to do and to have something affect you so personally that yeah. you carved out a career and, and made a path to see that through. That's that's fantastic. So well, it, quickly, it it certainly left me passionate about it, Mike. Yeah, that's that's the thing. It uh, you you've got to be able to source you you've got to be able to track a source of passion and sometimes go back to that source and understand it again and and realize that. You got here because, number one, you wanted to get here. Number two, because this is something that you are truly passionate about. Why are you so passionate about futures, pro-farmer, now going to Farm Journal and communicating? And what Being a good messenger, I, get, I understand, but why are you so passionate about being doing these roles, being a journalist, yeah. hearing? Why yeah, like I, like I said, in... Uh, 1980, 1981 was not a good time on the Flory farm in, in Jones County, Iowa. Uh, there was a farm sale, uh, in December of 1980. Um, I was 15 years old, but boy, I can remember it, you know, clearly. And it, it was because of coming through the farm crisis. My brother is, is older than I am. And, and he and my dad were trying to buy a farm. In 1978, 1979, everything was still going okay. Uh, it was a diversified farm. It was a successful farm, and we were making payments. But when they changed the rules in 1980, and the the idea became, uh, if if a if a farm or a business is so upside down. That that we that that a bank can't get any value out of it by foreclosing, that we will work with that farm or work with that bank, and or work with that that business, so that we can get it back to something that has a chance of paying us back. Versus, if a farm was operating and making payments and had equity and had value that could be attained. They shut the doors on those farms because they got what they could at the time, and and frankly, it it ticked me off. I, it made me mad, and to to see what was happening at that time, I I took that to Iowa State and worked on a couple of projects in the journalism department at Iowa State that I was really proud of at the time. Still am that. Uh, kind of exposed a lot of how the farm crisis was more of a savings and loans crisis than that than it was on the farm and all they all these savings and loans did was they just kicked the problem further down and and I it it in some cases it was just flat out that that happened yeah. Yeah. and um, I, I wanted to make sure that people understood that I wanted to make sure that and and one of the things that uh, that re- that intrigued me about Pro Farmer, which started by the way in 1973, uh, with the mission of leveling the playing field between the grain buyers and farmers, so that farmers would have the same information that the grain companies did when they were making business decisions 
uh, the decisions that are going to influence, you know, how successful their their business is going to be for that year. So um, that that was the kind of uh, that was the kind of service based journalism, I think, that I was uh, oh, I, that I was most interested in. Service based journalism. I, I like that. So we're, I want to talk about how reporting has changed, but you got to you got to. That, that you, this the '80s version of a, that song "Richmond North of Richmond" was yep. playing in my head when I heard you talking about this. Right, is detached from decisions and things that really affect yeah. people in in rural America and in their homes. And now it's 2023, so we're, we're a long way away from '81. There's fewer people in these communities. We need to find ways to continue to strengthen. So. What's changed? I, what's changed since then? Your, is your audience bigger? Is it smaller? Is it more or less important? Where are we at now in 2023, taking that spirit of 81 and that what you talked about? What's changed? What's the same? And I guess what gets you mad right now, Chip? Hmm. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's, it, it is the same. Yeah, no, it, it is. It's a lot different now. I, in the, I guess what gets me mad now is the willingness of our leadership to just flat out lie to you. Mm -hmm. Just treat you like you don't know any better. Um, and that happens and it comes from both parties. Okay. Yeah. I, I this is not a partisan gripe. Uh, this is across the parties. There are way too many people in leadership positions that are just flat out willing to lie. And uh, issues don't matter as much as party. Um, what's right doesn't matter as much as supporting your party line. And we got to find a way out of this. Uh, you, you know, it's been said before, but it, it is swampy. It is swampy, swampy north of Richland. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it needs to get cleaned out. Well, I was thinking, um, there was a study and, and I'm sure somebody will Google it and find it when they hear this, but there's some interesting things. You know, the founders, the frame, they, they put DC in the swamp. So a lot of things wouldn't happen. So things would happen closer to the people. So it's a lot harder to lie to people you have to look at every day, right? Yeah. Proximity breeds responsibility. But if you look at when air condition was invented and used and the amount of legislation and power and things that started coming out of DC, you can now live and thrive in the swamp. And yeah. so there's interesting things like that where people saw what was coming and we still make maybe some of the mistakes. I guess that's human nature. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I have a passion for this too because I think about how important it is to have thriving farms that mm -hmm. produce great food, good food supply uh, yep. for our country and for the world. Yep. And I think about how small of a group we've become, mm -hmm. yet how important it is to our country. And I think that's why some of your reporting and the work that you do is so, so critical. How much of it do you see is talking to an audience that understands us like us versus talking to an audience that doesn't understand it, but needs to be aware of the importance. How do you look at that as a journalist? Well, as a broadcast journalist, it, 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 see, and I still write a column in Farm Journal as the Farm Journal Economist. Okay. Uh, and and in that column, I I I avoid uh, you know dumbing it down mm -hmm. in in that uh, in that format because if someone's reading Farm Journal. Uh, magazine, they're coming for information, and I and it, it's an intelligent group. I think that that we are servicing with that with that magazine. And on AgriTalk, sometimes I need to take a route that is is uh, circuitous. Yes, yeah, because I want to make sure that the background is understood as much as. Uh, as as you know how we got to the point that we're at that right. needs to be understood not only for the farm listeners but for the non-farm listeners that that are listening out there and then when it comes to here's what it means for us going forward then i feel like i'm talking more directly to farmers because they're the ones that are going to have to use 
or that will use the information to make important decisions with. So I'll 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 talk directly more directly to farmers when we when we talk future, when we talked about how we got here, I, I talk a little bit more general. You know, for the um for Pro Farmer Newsletter, when I was writing that thing, which was a weekly publication. Yep. Um uh the the same editor, Bob Kaufman, that I talked to uh in high school and and in college. I uh, had a great line. He says, less of how it came to be and more of what it means to me. Uh, that just played over and over and over again in my head as I was writing Pro Farmer Newsletter. I'd, I'd give two or three lines of background and then move on to, here's why it's important to you and here's what you should do about it. Um. So it's it's a little bit different. It's quite a bit different on on AgriTalk now, but uh, I've in, I've enjoyed both for sure. It's it's an art to balance those things and and get get to that point. But you've got quite the following, quite the audience. Your content's incredibly valuable. Before I ask you about technology, and then we're going to move to that number and pro farmer crop tour. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to. So you you do a you do a lot of content. You're preparing a lot of things. I know you have your own broadcast medium, but for our audience, what's top of mind? Like, what's the thing that people need to know right now that you're writing about, talking about broadcasting? What's the most important thing you've come across recently that people need to know and why? Okay. Uh, I, <laughs> very, very timely question because I kind of designed this morning's show and this afternoon's show. Okay. Uh, we we do two shows a day, uh, uh, and we're by the way, you, you know, it is a podcast and it is available in a podcast form. It's also a radio show. <laughs> okay. We've got about 110 uh, affiliate stations around the Midwest. Uh, most of them in the 12 Midwest states. That uh, that AgriTalk is on twice a day, 10:06 and 2:06. So, but we we talked in both the morning show and the afternoon show. The morning show we talked policy. Uh, we talk issues, mm. uh, the news of the day. We'll have the newsmakers on. The afternoon is pretty much all about markets and, and what it means. Uh, we talked a lot about China today. Okay. Uh, the the uh, crop problems that they're having is what gets the conversation started. But eventually you come around to the slow economic growth. And this afternoon in the conversation with Craig Turner uh, from Stonex Group, we got into the population projections and how the demographics are going to be changing in China over the next 30, 40 years and what that might mean to overall demand. I, the, that population could fall to under a billion people by the time we get to 2050, 2055. <laughs> that, that's quite a drop. But today, if, if I'm correct, China has 20% of the global population but only 7% of the world's arable land, yeah. right? Yeah, so, something like that, yeah. So that changes kind of how we look at it, how we work. How does that play into this? Does that, even though the population is dropping, do they still hold that kind of percentage of demand or is the protein diet still going to need to be enriched and we still need more resource? What does that look like over the next 30 or 40 years? Not yeah. not to steal from your show, but just- no, that's. That's great. Uh, as the population pulls back, think about yeah. what that does to the workforce out there. That okay. workforce is going to be in higher demand, uh, cheap labor that we import from China in the trinkets that we that we get. Uh, that cheap labor is going to go away. So they're moving more and more into the middle class, smaller population, mm -hmm. bigger middle class, more buying power. And what are they... They're going to spend money on food. So e even though the population is going to be getting smaller in China, uh, demand for protein in particular, I think, is going to be very good. Very good. So yeah, that's that's amazing how interconnected these things are. So China pays a lot of attention, particularly the U.S. and Brazil markets, yes. for these inputs, correct? Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, and... They sh they showed when they had the problem with the uh, with their hog herd and the African swine fever, yeah, and called a lot of the sows and and really saw a dramatic 
cut in their ability to produce pork. Um, they did show a willingness to use the import market and to import some of that protein. And I think over time, um, that's probably going to become more and more important to China. And you can't just say China. It's going to be Southeast Asia. Yeah. Uh, it's it's going to become more and more important to the uh, for, for those countries to import uh, proteins and countries like the U.S., Brazil, even Australia uh, are going to be in a really good position to uh, facilitate some of that demand and, and, and provide that demand. I mean, look at the way that our crush industry is going to be changing here, Mike, yeah. with the renewable diesel and the sustainable aviation fuel. If that push continues, I think it probably will, especially for the renewable diesel, because it's it's state initiatives rather than federal initiatives that are kind of driving that thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we're building up our crush capacity so that we can produce more soybean oil to produce more renewable diesel. Um, that's going to leave us with a whole lot of soybean meal that if we can put it in a pig or put it in a dairy cow, or put it into beef and ship some of that overseas. I think that that's a that's a winner winner. I should have said poultry too. I mean, yeah, dead gum broilers, nothing more than a soybean with a beak. And <laughs> if we can if we can increase our our poultry exports, uh, boy, that's a that's a big winner for us. It, these dynamics are pretty interesting, uh, yeah. and some of these pull against each other, right? Because you've got crops to go into making food versus fuel, what that means. I don't know what this means for pricing. What I'm hearing is food everywhere is going to get more expensive here in the future, unless we figure out how to produce more from less, and that gets into technology. So yeah. we were just talking about 1981, 1973. Now we're here in 2023. What do you see? Like, There's been a lot of changes in tech, and we could probably go through a few pivotal, pivotal ones. As you think about these trends and changes, what technologies have made the biggest impact and where do we have room really to make even more impact and improvement with tech going forward? Yeah. The seed tech, they, I think, is is really, really high on this list. Uh, the ability to, uh, to, to manage some of the pests and manage some of the issues, including... You know, a corn plant's ability to withstand a, a period of hot and dry weather better. And so, uh, it, some of that is traditional plant breeding, too. I get that. Yeah. Uh, but just, you know, BT corn back in 1997, <laughs> good grief. Uh, it just, it, it changed the world. We were running the crop tour, started running the crop tour in 1993. And even in a year like 1994, which was one of the best crops that I can remember from crop tour, uh, we were starting to see that corn crop shut down in the third week of August just because uh, of corn borer issues. Uh, you, you, you know, the, the plant was opened up to disease. You, you broke the seal. Yep. And so it shuts down. When, when we, that BT corn, when it, kept that environment inside of the plant sealed for as long as it did and all of a sudden we're looking at green stalks with white husks late in the season it it blew me away it still blows me away to see it and uh i think that was just so un unbelievably important piece of technology for us man it it uh it was crazy <laughs> and, and looking forward i think technology is probably going to be most significant in solving some of our labor issues right mm -hmm. um but, you know automation i i think is coming uh what you guys do is is uh save it's knocking hours hours yeah out of a season for guides. Uh, so technology, I think, is going to 
will 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 focus most intently on solving some of the labor issues that we've got in agriculture. Yeah, labor and then understanding how these other technologies what's correlated to great success to so maximum output, good economic return. Mm-hmm. Which traits, which chemi- which management practices? I don't think we've as a industry we've not really put together all those ingredients in a systematic way so we can make those improvements, but we're on the way, right? That's that's the point. So many changes from 80s, 90s to where we are. Now, you said something is when you started the Pro Farmer Crop Tour, mm-hmm. and then you saw things. So let's, we're not getting to the number yet, yeah. but let's just open this up. Okay. What is the Pro Farmer Crop Tour, Chip? Okay. Okay. Pro Farmer Crop Tour was actually started in the 1970s by the Illinois Farm Bureau. Okay. And and Illinois Farm Bureau just did it across the the, the state of Illinois. Uh, Jim Quentin was a private crop consultant in I, I'm not even sure when Jim took it over from Illinois Farm Bureau, but Jim expanded it to include Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and most of Iowa, and every now and then somebody would sneak up into Minnesota and pull a few samples on that tour as well. Okay. So Jim then ran it until 1993. Uh, I started going on crop tour in 1988 as a reporter, okay, a wire service reporter. So I met Jim, I got to know Jim, and Jim got to know me. And it, it it was just something that it was, uh, even though it was much smaller than it is today, it, it was too big of an effort for Jim and, and his wife, Kathy, to, to handle, to to do. And, and he wanted to see the tour continue. We wanted to see the tour continue at Pro Farmer. And um, uh, so I worked with Jim in 1992. And then 93 was the first year that Pro Farmer ran the tour. We ran basically the same routes that Jim did for the first couple of years. And then we started to expand it because we wanted to include more of Iowa. So we started playing with the routes and moving things around. Um, And and then in 1996, uh, we started an effort to add the Western Corn Belt, South Dakota, Nebraska, make it easier to get to Western Iowa. And then we wanted to do more of Minnesota as well. So we started working on that. And every time I mention this, I got to say their names, Steve Carr and Terry Johnston. These two guys were uh, employees of Pro Farmer. And uh, they went out and busted their butts for two years, 1996 and 1997, to gather uh, uh, groundwork so that we would have something that we could compare to when we went out on tour for the first time in the Western Belt in 1998. So uh, I led that tour out west in 1998 and started uh, uh, Scott Davis, uh, who is it now at Bullpen Trading or owns Bullpen Trading up in Rochester, uh, was working with us at that time. And, and he was leading the eastern leg of the tour. And, mm-hmm. and ever since then, we've had this the split tour. Um, it, uh, it, we, the, the first time that we did it in 1993, I met the guys in uh Dayton, Ohio. I think there was eight I think there was 18 of us. We were at nine routes uh at, at for the evening meal. Uh we'd buy pizza and put a box of beer in the middle of the table and sit around and talk about what we saw that day. And then I would go to my room and enter all the data that we collected that day. At that time over the the course of 4 days we would we would collect you know maybe 500 samples something like that. It, it wasn't a huge number. It was a significant number, and it was a number that the markets paid attention to, but uh, uh, it wasn't nearly what it is today. Um, and so that was a lot of fun. Um, but when Farm Journal bought Pro Farmer in 1998, it was time to step this thing up, and we've got a much larger platform, uh, a much bigger soapbox, Let's blow this thing up. Let's start to find out exactly what we can do with it. 
and how much how much interest there there was in in going to a crop tour meeting. So we started to develop that in 2000, and it's basically been getting bigger and bigger ever since. I mean, we uh, last year on the final night of the crop tour, we had over a thousand people in the room in Rochester, and uh, it's pretty phenomenal to see what it's turned into. But uh, we'll have 350 people in Grand Island, 300 in Nebraska City, six, 700 up in Spencer. Uh, Brian will be looking at, at, at upwards of 900 people at Coralville or Iowa City on Wednesday night before he gets to Rochester. Smaller groups, uh, but still large. I mean, 250 to 300 people in the, uh, the in Indianapolis and in Bloomington uh, leading up to that big meeting in Iowa City. So uh, and now the, the last couple of years, we've pulled about 1,700 corn samples, 1,700 soybean samples. Uh, and we do that by running 10 different routes on the western leg. We run 12 different routes on the eastern leg. Uh, we split up into uh, groups of three or four teams, I mean, three or four people, and uh, put put those people in a vehicle. And it's gotten to the point that we're now able to split a lot of the routes. And that's why all of a sudden we went from from pulling 1,500 routes or even 1,400 uh, samples uh, over the four days to pulling 1,700 samples because we have two cars working the routes. One car will do half the route, the uh, the other car will do the other half. And uh, it's, it, it is amazing to see how the, the information comes together and we've done it the same way ever since uh, you know, when I was out on crop tour in 1988. We do it the same way. And that's what makes the data valuable. We keep it consistent year to year. We keep the sampling procedure the same. We bring as much randomness into it as we possibly can. And it creates this uh this consistent randomness that that puts value into the data and uh it's really cool yeah yeah so you're talking about samples and by the way there's a lot of numbers you mentioned those i assume are not the number that people we're not there yet we're not there yet we're gonna wait and i'm i'm waiting i'm being patient uh, my heartbeat was getting up there a little bit the more numbers i was waiting yeah. to see, yeah. see what the, what it was going to be so you talk about these samples and year over year, it is systematic. Okay, so what's your primary goal? It's to provide the industry with growing season information about likely corn and soybean yields. So how do these samples, how does it to work? If I've got that right, okay. how does it do that? And what's the, like, what does it mean to me? Right? Okay. We talked about how to get there. What does it mean to me and our listeners? Okay. So uh, the the process I think is important here. Like I, I've been talking That's about great. the different routes, we go down the road every fifteen to twenty miles. It depends on uh, how much ground you've got to cover that day. Uh, by the corn and soybean field that are close to each other, um, we get past the end rows in a cornfield and go thirty five paces down the main rows, and set up a thirty foot plot, two thirty foot plots of corn. We count all the ears that will make grain on the two rows. Uh, then from one of the rows, we pull the 5th, the 8th, and the 11th ear. From those ears, the data that we collect is the length of grain in inches. We don't measure the tip back. We don't count the kernels. We measure the length of grain in inches. We count the number of kernel rows around the ear. We we measure the row spacing in that field. So once we've got the ear population, the grain length in inches, the number of kernel rows around on averages, um, we and the and the row width in the field, we've got the information that we need to calculate the uh, to calculate an average yield. We do that in one spot on that field. If we get it right, it's because we were in the average spot in that field. Right. It's not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is pull 1,700 samples from one big Midwestern cornfield that will give us an idea of what the final yield will be. Um, the amount of time that we spend in a state, the 
areas that we cover in a state all helps to weight that appropriately. Mm -hmm. So we spent a half a day in South Dakota. We spent a half a day in Ohio. Okay. Uh, we don't collect as many samples out of Indiana as we collect out of Illinois or Iowa. Uh, it used to be that we got very few samples out of Minnesota. Minnesota is either the third or fourth biggest corn producing state. They now, the number of samples that we pull out of Minnesota is very similar to the number of samples that we pull from Nebraska. So the routes, the time that we spend, all of that stuff weights, weights uh, the sampling procedure for us out there. Um, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool the way that it all comes it comes together. Now on soybeans, we find a representative spot in the field. We don't march off past the endros and go thirty five paces. Find a representative spot in the soybean field. Measure three foot of row. Count all the plants in that three foot of row, and then pull three plants at random. We'll count all the pods on those three plants. Calculate the average, then the average number of pods per plant times the number of plants per row gives you the total number of pods in that three foot of row. Then, to make it possible to compare a 30 inch road bean to a 15 inch row to a seven and a half inch drilled, we take the number of pods in three foot of row times 36 and divide it by the row width. Therefore, we've got the number of pods in a three by three foot square. Uh, there's no hula hoops. There's no squares. That That's always, you know, been uh, uh, part of how other people explain what we do when we're out there on crop tour, that we've got a hula hoop that we just throw, and then we count all the pods in that, that are inside of that hula, hula hoop. No, no, there's never been a, not that I'm aware of, there's never been a hula hoop on crop tour. Um it, it it's all done the same way, and it was all started. This, that procedure was started by um, by Illinois Farm Bureau as well. And and really, what that does is it uh, it doesn't give us a yield, but it gives us an idea of how much of the production factory is up and running on the bean crop that year. Okay. Yep. So for those that are going to attend, and I want to, you tell a little bit more about the Pro Farmer Crop Tour, you know, we've got it coming up. You've got two legs, east and west starting, right? So August 21st, I think is the starting yep. date, Noblesville and Grand Island. Yep. Five but- Indiana's number five in corn producing. You're starting out there. Uh, those listening, they should bring hula hoops is what I heard you say. You want yeah. to see lots of hula hoops. Uh, yeah, wrong no. to these destinations. Uh, yeah, no, oh, no, no, no need to bring your hula hoop. Uh, bring a tape measure, bring tape a measure. tape measure, okay. and some boots. Yep, that'd be good. That'd be good. So and it's gonna start in Noblesville, just, and then you got Grand Island, and it goes, you know, yeah. from there, culminating in Rochester, yeah. Minnesota. Well, yeah, the western leg of the tour starts in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Okay, so so Falls. day so day one, we go through uh, southeast South Dakota and northeast Nebraska, make our way down to the to Grand Island. So we'll do everything north of the Platte River. Day two, we go from Grand Island to Nebraska City and cover everything south of the Platte River. Day three on the western leg is the western three crop tour districts in Iowa, crop districts one, four, and seven, and we make our way to Spencer, Iowa. Okay. And that's the last uh, tour, that's the last sample that the western leg will pull out of Iowa. Uh, it, that happens on Wednesday. Thursday, we go up into Minnesota and make our way over to Rochester. The eastern leg of the tour starts in Columbus and makes their way over to Noblesville. Okay. Okay. And then Noblesville to Bloomington, Bloomington to Iowa City, and Iowa City to Rochester to meet up with us from from the uh, west. Okay. So two different two different groups. We've got you know, it's right at 100 scouts, and they're evenly split between the eastern and the western leg this year. Very evenly split, so uh, more than enough. So, hey, welcome back here to the Acre Forward podcast. You can see that I'm now in a different location. Ship the excitement over the one number, which we're going to get to, yeah. cause a little bit of a power outage. I think we broke Zoom briefly. Kind of like DeSantis breaking Twitter. 
back then, you know, we, yep. so we've, we've got additional servers to back this up, the ones we use to monitor acres. And so now we're ready to go. So I want to back up. You were talking to, a little bit about the Pro Farmer Crop Tour. Yeah. Again, we'll get to the number. So for the audience that's listening, you're getting samples, you get yield estimates. In a nutshell, why should someone attend? What do they need to know? And why is yeah. Pro Farm Crop Tour important, Chip? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's real time analysis. You know, it's a discovery process, and you got to let it be that discovery process that it is. So if as we go out there and collect all the samples each day, we come in, we we finalize the uh, the data for each state, and then we release that as soon as we've got it available. So it's real time reporting, it's real time analysis, and it. Uh, you know, you can see you can see that uh, the markets pay attention to what we're putting out there. Uh, doesn't always move the markets, and that's not our intention at all. Uh, it, and that it, that's just doesn't even come into our thinking when we're out there. But what it does, what it does happen, we we pay attention to it, we respect it, we treat it with the uh, with with the you know kick gloves that that we need to to treat it with and that's really great so it, it's coming up and we were talking about one number right if i want to attend this what do i need to do how do i need to know about it and then okay. yeah, let's, let's get towards that number that that we teased at the beginning of the program here you bet okay the best way to attend at this point forward is to get registered for the eight o'clock well, actually, we're going to start streaming at 7.57 p.m. Central Time. Uh, the reason that we do that is because we embargo the release of the data that we have each day until 8 o'clock p.m. Uh, but get online, uh, go to profarmer.com, find the registration for the evening stream, and then we should be able to, you know, and if you go from there, profarmer.com slash register, it should take you right to where you need to be uh, for the, uh, yeah, there it is right there, slash register. So get signed up for the evening stream. There may be some room left at a couple of the meetings on the eastern leg of the tour, but I think the western leg is pretty much uh, filled up uh, to capacity. So that, it's great. Out we'll, have a, we'll have the links in our show notes so people can get to the Pro Farmer Tour. I think get yourself to profarmer.com, follow Chip on Agritalk, these other places, and there's great ways for you to interact, know what's happening in these results. So now, this number, we talked a lot of numbers today, 1700, yep. this, this, or this. What is this this number that you're talking about with regard to Pro Farmer Crop Tour? That, okay, okay. That- uh, and this is a number that will be uh, used as Pro Farmer puts together their crop estimate for corn. Um you take all the samples from all seven states, you put them into one spreadsheet, and we've got two, two yield calculations that are driven by the same data set. The one calculation is an adjustment that tries to account for the size of kernels based on the number of kernel rows around the ear. It was terrible. Uh, it, 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 it's the old crop tour calculation and it didn't work with today's genetics and with today's management so i believe i think it was 2005 mike we went back and back tested all the data and just decided that we needed to take that adjustment off but doesn't mean that we still don't look at that number at least internally so when we take all 1700 and we run the adjusted yield calculation with the yield calculation that will be reported throughout the week and then take the average of those two numbers. Yes. That's going to get you really close to what the national average corn yield is going to be. That and this is something, this is something we can come back and look back on and verify, yes. correct? Yes, absolutely. So, absolutely. so this, this magic number, this number that comes from all these data points, the pro farmer tour, now that's a lot of math. I my degree is in political science, so I'm gonna believe you. But we're gonna take all of this math. You're gonna arrive at an estimate, yeah. at a number, and you're saying at the end of the year, when the USDA and everybody finishes up, it's gonna line up uh, to the national average. 
the the goal is to be within one percent. One percent. So yeah. here now, I'd like to to have you back here when we get there and actually drive through those numbers. If yeah, will. But that's that's quite a that's quite a claim that tells me that if if I'm farming and corn and beans are poured to me, that I need to pay attention to pro farmer crop tour. I need to be part of this because I want to get a sneak peek and an early uh, yeah. understanding of the potential here that's going, what's happening here at corn and soybeans. Exactly. And Mike, you know, the other thing on this that I haven't mentioned yet is, uh, I think it was three years ago, USDA stopped doing the objective um, yield data sampling in their, in their field, their uh, yield plots. Okay. So this is the first broad based effort to go out and pull the husk back and take a look at what's, what's under the husk. So uh, this is, uh, yeah, it's it's an, an important, in my opinion, it's an important event for the industry. It, well, obviously, and especially with changes like that, any of these data points are helpful. Uh, this that's what we think about every day is is how do we understand better about what we're doing? We have we talked about the advances in equipment and traits and chemistry. We have so many things that help us, but what we haven't done and we can do now with the new technologies, like what we do uh, with the Acre Forward technology, like what you're doing. We can take these data points and we really can understand like game tape for your acre. How does the weather, how does your management practice? What are you doing? How did you perform? How did the hybrid perform? What decisions can we take? And what do we need to continue to do? What do we need to stop doing? What do we, and that's probably a very local field by field decision. But now at 2023 chip, we live in a world where we can actually do that and record that, not just from machines, but from the sky and with efforts like what you're talking about. So I, I think it's going to get better and better every year, but it's a, it's a very unique time to be living because I think we're just at the beginning of true advancement and yield and productivity. Yep. Very cool. Very cool, Mike. Very cool. So before we wrap up uh, this extended version of the Acre Forward podcast, uh, where I actually did a wardrobe change here uh, to wrap up here, the, uh, the, the meeting, what else is on your mind, Chip, that you want our listeners to know and any closing thoughts here today? Um, it, we haven't talked a whole lot about soybeans. Um, yeah. the, the, the soybean balance sheet is, is tight. Um, okay. it, 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 and the weather during crop tour week and the week after, I think is really going to tell us just how this soybean crop is going to perform a bushel per acre in either direction on the soybean yield from USDA's number uh, in August makes a huge difference in the outlook for that soybean market. And if it's going to make a big difference on soybeans, of course, it'll, it'll have an impact on what that corn market is going to do as well. So um, there's more, vulnerability to price moves coming out of the, the this tour for soybeans, I think, than there is on corn. Why why are why is the soybean balance sheet so tight for our viewers and listeners? What's what's going on that's creating that dynamic? Um you, you know it's uh number one thing is acres. Uh we just didn't get as many soybean acres or as many acres planted to soybeans as we expected for 2023. Those acres went to corn, and it looks like there could even be some acres added to the corn plantings for 2023 yet. Uh, but soybean acres may be up just a little bit, 100,000, maybe 200,000, but not enough to move the needle. So when we're looking at the lower acres without a record yield, without a 52 bushel per acre national average yield. Right. We're just not adding enough back to the supply side to get things comfortable. We've already pulled the demand expectations back on 2023-24, but with that crush capacity that's coming on, Mike, uh, you can't lean on the demand side of the bean market too hard because you'll, you'll make a mistake doing that. So, Instead of a 350 million bushel carry, instead of 300 million bushel, we're probably looking at something south of 250 million bushels, and it's going to be real easy to slide under 200 million bushels if we would lose a bushel across the country. Wow, that's that's pretty that's pretty major. So the 
the earliest we can know that and understand that can help us make some yep. right decisions now and for next year, which is why Pro Forma Crop Tour yep. uh, can also be really critical to anybody making decisions now on, on grain or for next season, what they need to be doing. That's right. That's right. Good stuff. Absolutely great stuff. Yeah, so we're here in August. We're already thinking about what we're planning for next year and decisions we're making. Many of the folks listening to this have already made or are making their decisions of you know, what they want to do and change uh, for next season. I think anybody hearing this, and I do want to thank Chip really for your time and your expertise, and I can't wait to do this again and check those estimates, but you bet. everybody that's listening to this, whether you're an advisor, a grower, or both, you know, working together, they all know how to get a hold and listen to Chip Flory, whether it's AgriTalk, Pro Farmer, uh, Farm Journal. It's just, it's really great to have you here and want to thank you for uh, joining us here today. Oh, it's been a pleasure, Mike. Thank you. So I want to thank our audience again for joining the discussion. And here, when we say acre forward, we're talking about a passion to drive and see more value from every acre. Pro Farmer Crop Tour is certainly going to do that. Go check that out at profarmer.com. Also, we understand that every acre tells a story. And here at Tarantis and with Acre Forward Technologies, we help illustrate it, but you're the author of your own success. So if you want to learn more and see more stories like Chip Flory's story and others, check us out at acreforwardpodcast.com. Thank you. 